Hey folks, Kevin here. Uh, I'm trying to record a video today to address a, uh, an email that I got from an herbalist and, uh, and it wasn't directed to me. It was just uh, an attention getter saying, geez, there, there's a lot of concern out there with people reading about elderberry syrup or elderberry products being taken at this time with this very uh, significant infectious disease process that's going around all over the globe. Now I live in New York State, so New York City has a high concentration of people who are infected with this virus agent. And, uh, and one of the concerns uh, that people have raised is this, this notion of a cytokine storm. First let me say, the reason I'm making this video is because we sell elderberry uh, plants here. I currently have some listed locally for, on Craigslist. So anybody who, who is concerned about this, I thought I'd at least give some explanation about this. Now, I'm a big proponent of, uh, of herbal supplements uh, for various different conditions and even uh, for some tr therapeutic interventions with some very serious diseases, and I've mentioned those in the past. But today I'm just going to restrict our talk to the elderberries. Uh, and so the elderberry syrup has been shown to, during flu season, to uh, reduce the, uh, re potentially reduce the attachment of the, the flu virus and potentially decrease the duration of symptoms of flu uh, and the rate of recovery, those sorts of things. And, and the, to be honest with you, I haven't read through the research articles about that. But when uh, cytokine storms, uh, beca you know, when that came to my attention, I did, did, did a little bit of quick research. And so when I do research, I want to go to uh, open up a web browser, go to Google, then type in Google Scholar and then Google Scholar, it brings up a, a, a specific uh, search engine that searches the, uh, the literature for scientific uh, data. And, uh, and then you have to separate through that and see what studies apply. And so there's many studies that look at in vitro, that's like in a Petri dish, as opposed to in vivo inside of the body. And then there's studies that look like mice studies and that sort of thing. So I don't want to go too far with any of these things because I can get quite wordy. So what can I say about, uh, about the concern of a cytokine storm? So what is a cytokine? A cytokine is a, cellular, a cell's component that is released or, or is a chemical communicator, a molecule that's released that, that communicates with other cells in the, in the body. It may be released from an injured cell, so a cell that gets injured and opens up a little bit, and part of its constituents get released into the environment called the extracellular matrix. So we have cells, and then we have the matrix that holds the cells, and then we have the lymphatic vessels, and we have muscles, and we have uh, skeletal parts, we have ligaments and tendons and all that, and then we have all of these blood vessels. Well, the blood vessels are, are all of our highways and the way of getting our immune system to, to uh, reach the areas. It's a way of getting our nutrients uh, to reach the areas. Although we, we, we may absorb the nutrients through our digestive system and process them uh, through the, uh, uh, the liver, uh, but ultimately these nutrients and oxygen and, and our immune system travel through all of the circulatory system. And the smallest part of our circulatory system are called the capillary beds. And if we were to take the capillary beds uh, or the capillaries, which are the tiniest thin-walled vessels, which, which are the most important part that do all the exchange with our cells in the body uh, and do all the transportation, the, the, the real meat of the matter, if you were to take all of those capillaries and hook them end to end in an adult human being, they'd wrap around the earth at the level of the equator twice. So there's a tremendous number of tiny little capillaries even in your finger. And uh, let's say I hit my finger with a hammer. No infectious agents, I didn't break the skin, but some of those cells that get injured release these cytokines. And, and so some of them are IL, and that stands for interleukins, or TNF-alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha. These are just labeled based on 
on the nomenclature that was attributed to these at the time of their discovery and all. So there's a whole bunch of these different cytokines and interleukins and all. So IL-1, IL-6, TNF-alpha, and IL-8 are very well-known pro-inflammatory cytokines, chemical communicators that, that respond to an inflammatory process, something happening. So when I hit my finger, you bang your shoulder, whatever, fall on your knee, you may initially, uh, and, and you, let's say you don't even disrupt the skin, initially the area becomes swollen, it becomes red, and it becomes warm. So what's happened is those cytokines from those cells that were injured communicated with the circulatory system and the capillaries started letting red blood cells and white blood cells out into the area because they're all damaged at the same time. And as a result, the cell concentration and the cell volumes increased so that so you got a bump. Uh, it became very red because there's lots of red blood cells release, releasing a hematoma. So you get red blood cells in that area as well. And it becomes painful. So swelling, redness, heat, and pain are the things that we think about. And if you follow that and the skin isn't broken and you just monitor it over time, you'll see that gradually the swelling starts to come down some. The color goes from red to blue. So we go from oxygenated red blood cells to deoxygenated red blood cells. And then the blue gradually starts to turn to green. Uh, and then, then it turns to yellow, and as the, uh, the, the other cleanup cells get released into the area and come and take those out, eventually the area goes right back to a normal looking tissue. However, and so that's so important that these pro-inflammatory cells get released into the circulation and communicate with other cells and say, hey, you know what? There's something going on over here. I want to bring some of my white blood cells in here to clean up. I want to bring oxygen to the area and those sorts of things. So uh, the inflammatory process that is mediated by cytokines is necessary and it's the first step of wound healing. So now let's say we, uh, we have a, a very upset gastrointestinal system. We've either been having a diarrhea, diarrhea or vomiting or we, got, uh, we ate something that wasn't bad and we started getting blood into our digestive system. Well, bacteria, gram-negative bacteria can, can release part of their, their membrane, their outer coating, and that's called a lipopolysaccharide. And that lipopolysaccharide gets into the circulation. That triggers a, a pretty significant inflammatory response. And uh, again, that communicates with all the immune system. And those, the uh, blood cells, the white blood cells, go from just circulating through the system. Numbers are increased. They become marginalized in the vessels as they, as they get close to the, to the site where the injury is. And they start making their way out of that blood vessel in to address the, the injury there in your digestive system. And hopefully everything uh, resolves. But that lipopolysaccharide, or LPS, uh, is an endotoxin. And many studies have compared endotoxins to the effect of, uh, of the elderberry constituents. So the endotoxin is a, pro, is a potent pro-inflammatory uh, chemical communicator. So, and so are these uh, potentially some of the components of the elderberry syrup or elderberry products that you consume. I know this is getting pretty long-winded and I'm sorry, I'm, I don't want to go too deep here. But what ends up happening is uh, we can potentially heal more quickly when we're taking some of these elderberry products that, that don't already have an appropriate inflammatory response. So elderberry syrup may be very good if we're not able to or during the very onset or just before we get it, uh, a, a disease process. It potentially could be beneficial. There isn't there isn't a lot of evidence to support that. Studies need to be done. But the concern or the red flag that's causing concern is the cytokine storm. So what is a cytokine storm? A cytokine storm is when those pro-inflammatory mediators or cytokines that are released from cells get exaggerated. And elderberry syrup does do some promoting of those release of the cytokines so that you have more of an appropriate response. 
When we have an infectious disease that targets the smallest areas of air exchange in our lungs, then that's a dangerous place to have too much inflammation. The, in, the additional inflammation causes leakiness of those vessels, like I described in the capillaries that go through the thumb or the finger that got swollen up. Uh, that increase inflammatory process ultimately re re results in the cells getting to that injured tissue. However, in the alveoli, the, the alveolus, the area where all of the gas exchange happens, which is very narrow and thin as well, if it's fighting an infectious disease process there, we don't want to have too much inflammation because the vessels become leaky and our plasma or our water in our body and our proteins weep into the, into the alveoli and alveolus. And, and it decreases our, our functioning part of our, of our lower airway. And therefore, we can, we can decrease our, our ability to exchange oxygen. And it becomes more difficult to, to breathe. And, uh, and it's, it, we can drown in our own body fluids if our inflammatory response in our lungs exceeds the beneficial aspects. And so... I think this, there, who knows if there ever will be studies on this, but that uh, stimulated me to think, geez, this is not something. If you have signs of this infectious disease process that's going on right now, and, and you're concerned that maybe elderberry syrup may be helpful, I would caution you that's not a wise thing. Um, and I don't know this for certain, but I wouldn't recommend taking elderberry syrup or elderberry elixirs or any other elderberry products if you're, if you're concerned that you may have this infectious disease. If you have a dry cough, if you have a fever, if you've been exposed to people with this infectious agent, I caution you not to take, take those products at this time. I don't know that it's, de that it's detrimental, but we do know that, that physiologically what does happen, our immune system is, is promoted to increase an inflammatory response, and that's the place that you don't want to have too much in inflammatory response, not down there in those very delicate uh, membranes uh, around our lungs that allow us to breathe. It's a very thin, it's, 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 it's such a thin uh, tissue where gas is exchanged that it's so important that, the, that those tissues don't start to break apart and lose their cellular integrity. And as a result, fluids weep into that spot which you usually are breathing air into. And remember, our lungs are necessary for taking in oxygen and relieving carbon dioxide. That's super important. I hope I haven't made this too complicated. I hope it makes sense. If you have comments or questions, please leave them below. And again, I'm not against herbal supplements by any means. I'm all for doing the research with anything you're going to take. What are the things that will protect us the most during this infectious disease process? Number one, social distancing. That's number one. Number two, eating a good, healthy diet, a predominantly plant-based diet with lots of different colors, the reds, the blues, the purples. The potatoes we grow here and the ones we eat here are blue uh, potatoes. Most people know that blueberries and blackberries have all of these potent antho anthocyanins that are so beneficial. Eating broccoli, like we've talked about before, with the sulforaphane, uh, those are, are potent phytonutrients as well. Remember, you have to uh, chop up the broccoli before cooking it in order for it to have the sulforaphane at high enough concentrations. The garlic is good for you as well. So there's so many wonderful plant uh, nutrients out there. We want to get all of those plant nutrients. And during this time of stress, we've got to find some way of calming ourselves down. It might be meditation, it might be prayer, it might be uh, turning on a movie that's, that can take your mind off it, watching old family films, looking through the, um, through the photo albums if you have those and all, doing things that help to calm you down so that you can become more relaxed. Remember, your immune system can't function normally if you're stressed out. And, for, and There's good stress and there's bad stress. It's always bad stress if you're chronically stressed out.
So chronic stress is going to raise your cortisol levels, which interferes with your inflammatory, with your immune response. You need your immune response to be as effective and as efficient as possible at this time. So getting your rest, uh, think positive thoughts if at all possible. Uh, try to address those worries so that uh, you can get them off your plate if, if at all possible. Eat really good, nutritious food. Drink lots of, of good water. Try to stay off all the other all the sugars and that stuff. Re reduce saturated fat in your diet. Reduce sugars and salts in your diet. And those sorts of things. That's all I can think of right now. Uh, so if you have any comments or questions, please leave them below. Give us a thumbs up if you found this a value and share it with anyone that you think it may be a value as well. I'm not against elderberries. I sell the elderberry plants. I think they're great along with many other herbal uh, uh, plants as well. So hang in there, folks. Uh, stay calm. Take care of yourself. Take care of your neighbors. Think positive thoughts. Bye-bye now. Thank you.